So just a quick introduction, Channel Islands Restoration is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we are a habitat restoration contractor. We do environmental consulting and environmental education. Next. If you would like to see other webinars in this series, you can go to cirweb.org slash webinars where we have more than a couple of dozen past presentations available on that web page. So this uh, presentation will be available in a few days on that uh, site too. We'd like to acknowledge here at CIR that we all live in the beautiful unceded homeland of the Chumash people. Next slide. Uh, we seek to honor the original inhabitants of this land. So with that, Maury, do you want to start the uh, share or start the uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube? Yeah, I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, Brian, do you want to go ahead and share your screen there? So um, I'll do a little bit of an introduction. The Environmental Defense Center is who we're hearing from today. Welcome, guys. Um, they're going to provide an overview of EDC and its role as a nonprofit profit public interest firm serving Santa Barbara, Ventura, and San Luis counties. EDC has played an important role in preserving some of our region's most treasured open spaces. This uh, presentation is going to cover uh, several of EDC's successful efforts and ongoing campaigns to preserve areas threatened uh, with development, including Elwood Mesa, Douglas Family Preserve, Carpentaria Bluffs, Naples, Moore Mesa, Sedgwick, San Marcos Foothills, and Hearst Ranch. Uh, our presenters are Brian Troutwine and Linda Kropp. Brian uh, grew up in Galita and graduated from UCSB's Environmental uh, Studies <laughs> Department in 1990, earning a uh, the department's first Outstanding Alumni Award in 1995. He co-founded the Santa Barbara Urban Creeks Council in 1987 after discovering a steelhead spawning pool in his neighborhood, Creek, and ha uh, uh, had been bulldozed. Oh, my. He provides uh, critical support to EDC's lawyers and helps to uh, help defeat the Puente power plant in Oxnard, the Santa Barbara Mar Maria Reda Refinery Oil Trans Project. Oh yeah, that one. The three Cat Canyon and oil projects in Northern Santa Barbara County, Exxon's proposed oil trucking program and proposed development of hotels and golf courses on Hearst Ranch. Brian directs CDC's watershed protection and education program, which uh, has removed over 20,000 pounds of trash from local creeks. Uh, Linda is the, uh, Linda Krupp is the chief counsel of the EDC. She has practiced environmental law at EDC since 1989 and specializes in cases addressing the protection of coastal open spaces and natural resources, as well as offshore energy issues such as oil and gas development. She's worked on several successful open space preservation efforts throughout California's Central Coast, including Hearst Ranch, Carpinteria Bluffs, Elwood Shores, Douglas Family Preserve. I don't know about that, this one, Fiscalini Ranch. Oh yeah, that sounds familiar. You'll have to tell us about that one later. Oxnard Shores, Ormond Beach, and Sedgwick Ranch. Linda represented the conservation community on the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council. Yay, I uh, recently got appointed to that. Uh, she represented, um, uh, was on that uh, council from 1998 through 2013. And she teaches environmental law at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Well, I went ahead and gave you the full on, uh, introduction there without my normal editing down. Uh, it's really interesting bios. You know, feel free to fill us in on some more and we are looking forward to your presentation. So who are we going to first, uh, Linda or Brian? Thank you, I will lead us off. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for um, having us. 
Um, thank you all who are taking uh, time out to join us this evening. Really appreciate that. Hopefully you're staying cool and out of the heat. Um, so I wanted to start out by just giving a little bit of background on the Environmental Defense Center in addition to what Ken mentioned. Um, we were one of uh, several organizations that formed in our area as a result of the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. And um, our role in the aftermath of that oil spill was to help our communities use a vast array of new environmental protections that passed because of the oil spill. So, you know, laws requiring environmental review, we never had that before, kind of take that for granted now. Um, the Endangered Species Act, the Modern Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act, coastal laws um, at the state and federal level. So, you know, we had this new awareness of the threats to our environment, especially from industrial and other types of human uses and activities. And now we have a lot more um, ability to respond to them and to prevent any further disasters um, and to try to protect our precious uh, resources here. So that was why EDC was formed. Our mission is to protect and enhance the local environment that includes Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo counties. And we do that by mainly representing other organizations. And over our last 45 plus years, we have represented 140 other organizations. So probably many groups that you are involved with, um, we've um, been involved with them as well as partners and as their counsel. So I like to think of it as we are your lawyers. Um, we are the only nonprofit such law firm uh, between San Francisco and LA. And what makes us unique is um, our regional focus, but also the fact that being a nonprofit organization as well as a law firm, we can do a lot of things other than just filing lawsuits. So a lot of our work is education, webinars like this, um, but educating the community, educating those in you know, positions of decision-making authority um, and enforcement. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy uh, before public agencies like city councils and boards of supervisors and the Coastal Commission, regional water boards, et cetera. Um, and then as a last resort, if we need to, we can file litigation to enforce important environmental protection laws. So with that, um, I'm gonna, let's advance the slide and give you just a quick overview of some of the types of cases we get involved with. So one area that we're um, involved with is making sure we have clean water, um, both for drinking, for recreating, um, et cetera. So we, have the ability under the Clean Water Act to bring our own lawsuits directly against polluters, um, whether it's an industrial site that is discharging pollutants um, or if it's you know, broader um, discharges like through stormwater systems. Um, but our goal here is you know, to protect water quality for people and wildlife. Next slide, please. Another area um, where we're very active is um, Many issues involving the Santa Barbara Channel, which is one of the most important um, ecosystems on the planet because we are in a transition zone between the Northern and Southern Pacific waters. So we have the highest level of biodiversity here um, on the mainland United States. So outside of Hawaii, um, we have the largest seasonal population of blue whales on the planet. Um, they are threatened here mainly by um, uh, ship strikes. We had five blue whales um, die as a result of ship strikes several years ago. Um, so one of our ongoing efforts is to try to protect these um, imperiled uh, species, the largest animal that has ever lived on the planet. Um, we also um, protect other wildlife. We um, were involved in, I think, three separate lawsuits to protect sea otters, allow them to um, restore them to their natural habitat and um, hopefully allow um, that expansion to allow them to recover so they can be taken off the endangered species list. Uh, we're very involved with the Channel Islands National Park and Sanctuary. As I mentioned, we've been representing the conservation community on the Sanctuary's Advisory Council. So we get involved in various management decisions, dealing with you know, water quality, dealing with 
nowadays issues like climate and ocean acidification, um, also around the Channel Islands, as well as onshore, promoting and helping establish a network of marine protected areas. Uh, we just had the 10 year review of these marine protected areas and uh, the review shows that they have been amazingly successful at helping um, restore um, wildlife in these areas that are protected from take. So, you know, more fish, larger fish, just the whole ecosystem um, involving not just fish, but also um, uh, eelgrass and other um, kelp, things like that, that are important to our ocean ecosystem. So they've been very successful. Uh, we're also working on issues in our channel involving aquaculture. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about um, some other energy issues, but there's a, it's a really important place to protect. And so we are very involved there. Next slide, please. Um, you know, we were formed because of the 1969 oil spill, um, which occurred because there were no environmental protection laws at the time. Uh, you know, the federal government did not look at the potential impacts of allowing these new platforms, especially without the proper technology and, and protection from um, leaking oil wells. So to this day, we continue to work to try to protect our coast from more oil and gas drilling. Uh, we brought a lawsuit that terminated about half of the oil leases in the Santa Barbara Channel. Um, we more recently filed a lawsuit after finding out that some oil companies were actually fracking from the platforms. And we won a recent uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision banning that kind of practice because environmental laws had not been followed. But there's a whole host of issues in our area involving oil and gas development, whether you know there have been efforts to import natural gas through liquefied natural gas terminals, proposals for oil trains and trucks for a community. We've been able to stop all of them so far, but we have to keep up the vigilance and we're still involved with some litigation on these issues. But you know, in addition to trying to stop um, and minimize the threats of offshore oil and gas development, we're also trying to promote the transition to clean energy. And uh, we're very involved in the offshore wind proposals, primarily um, the Morro Bay wind energy area. There's three um, recent leases up there. And so we've been working with the federal agencies and industry to try to make sure that any offshore wind projects are sited appropriately. So we've been able to you know, move them further offshore, um, but also make sure that they're you know, designed appropriately to minimize impacts and that there's proper monitoring and adaptive management because this is a whole new technology out there. Um, so we're very involved in that issue as well. Next slide, please. And then I'm going to talk more. Brian and I are both going to talk more about our work to protect open space and wildlife. But this is a very large you know, part of our history as well. One of our very first cases was to protect Hammond's Meadow from a large development project. Uh, we represented the Surfrider Foundation. We protected the meadow plus that access trail. Um, to the beach um, from there. So 45 years later, we're still working to preserve some of our most iconic open spaces. And um, we'll talk about that in a little bit here. Next slide. Okay, I'll take it over from here and hand it back to Linda in a few more minutes. Um, you know, Linda and I wanted to, well, first let me introduce myself. Uh, Ken, you did a great job introducing me, but I am Brian Troutwine, the Senior Analyst and Watershed Program Director with EDC. Worked with Linda at the EDC for a long time. I'm working to protect our local environment. And Linda and I wanted to begin the heart of the webinar with the recognition that EDC works throughout the unceded lands of the Chumash peoples, from the Mee Chumash on what we now call the Channel Islands, to the Amuwu to the north and the bands in between, as well as all those that came before, all of whom have called this area home for time immemorial. We hold deep respect for the Chumash elders past and present. We have so much to learn from them about protecting and restoring the land and watersheds, and we have so much work to do to begin the healing process. And thank you to Channel Islands Restoration. They are the go-to group for anything related to habitat restoration and management. 
We all know of Channel Island's great work on San Marcos foothills and out on the islands, but they do so much more behind the scenes and deserve much support and recognition. Well, I grew up hiking our local creeks. You might say I fell in love with our streams as a teenager, and um, that, that put me on the path to where I am now, working for the EDC. Our creeks offer so many values. The healthy creeks serve as filters to clean the water flowing to the ocean and the water that's percolating into our depleted groundwater basin. And creeks provide recreational areas and places for people to escape the hustle and bustle of modern life and you know, really go out and enjoy nature. Our creeks carry floodwaters to the sea and protect us. Creeks are wildlife hotspots and they serve as wildlife movement and migration corridors. But our streams are threatened by pollution, water diversions, groundwater pumping, habitat clearing, urban development, and many other problems. The main components of EDC's watershed program are our successful and fun creek cleanups, our annual stream surveys, preparation of technical reports, and convening of the Watershed Alliance, which I'll talk about momentarily. But every place on the landscape is part of a watershed, and everything flows downhill into a creek. In this way, everything is connected from the ridges to the ocean and all land uses, no matter where they are, affect our watersheds. Local creeks support many rare species and this is because the creeks themselves are threatened. Local creeks and rivers are home to some of the few remaining Southern California steelhead runs, one of the rarest fish in the United States. This photo shows a steelhead trying to jump over a dam in Goleta. And the California red-legged frog, which is a federally threatened species. The two-striped garter snake is a state species of special concern that you've probably seen around our creeks. And creeks are also home to the protected arroyo chub, a small fish, and rare birds like the least bells vireo. But climate change, water wells, creek diversions, these are drying up our creeks, and that's perhaps the biggest threat that these species face. This is the last known steelhead to have migrated from the ocean up into our local creeks. She's a 22 inch female that made her way up through the Goleta Slough in 2017, but she got trapped below a dam under Highway 101. You can see her mate swimming just below her. Uh, he's a 10 inch rainbow trout and they're swimming over that cleared area in the gravel. That's their nest, also called a red. She keeps the nest clear by flushing her tail to move the sediment out from the gravel so that her eggs stay oxygenated. Now, this was a remarkable story because this pool was right next to a public bike path and people came all day long, every day to stop and watch the steelhead swim around in that pool. Subsequent rains allowed this steelhead to get back out to the ocean, but unfortunately the creek went dry before the eggs hatched. Now steelhead are an indicator species. Their presence and their health indicates healthy watersheds. The fact that they're gravely endangered signals that our watersheds are not healthy. But these fish truly are the, the Kool-Aid fish uh, as dubbed by Craig Fusaro, just add water and they tend to show up. And that's exactly what we're trying to do, get the water back in our creeks and rivers. Now in that same year, 2017, steelhead did successfully spawn in a Royal Hondo just up the coast. So there's definitely hope for this species. Okay, this is the California newt. It's a state species of special concern and one of my very favorites. It's also, one of the most toxic species on the face of the planet. Um, it has the same toxin as the puffer fish. Unfortunately, the local population has really dropped in recent years where we used to see a dozen or more newts in just about every pool in our creeks. Now we see one or two if that, they're really in trouble. Okay, this is the Western, the Southwestern pond turtle. I apologize, it's a little grainy there, but there you can see that this turtle, which is being considered for listing as an endangered species, swimming up toward the surface of this pool in an undisclosed local creek. It's California's only native turtle. 
They can live to be 45 years old, but there's only a handful of breeding locations remaining in our area, including that one. So the steelhead, um, in 2008, three ocean run steelhead, each over 20 inches migrated up Carpinteria Creek to spawn and they reached this eight foot deep spawning pool. But overnight, a water well was turned on and it literally sucked the creek dry, killing all the fish, including met many resident rainbow trout. Eggs were found on the dry creek bed after this happened. These fish were ready to spawn. This photo is by Mauricio Gomez of South Coast Habitat Restoration, and they're doing gr a great job removing barriers to steelhead migration. And you know, with climate change, we have more frequent fires, and that creates a problem for the fish as well. Debris flows after the Thomas fire may have wiped out all the remaining steelhead in Carpinteria Creek. In fact, there may only be about three or four creeks in our area that still have steelhead the populations drop by over 99%. EDC is working to bring back the flows on the San Ynez River and Santa Maria River, which once had large steelhead runs. The San Ynez River alone had a run of over 30,000 steelhead before Lake Kachuma and Bradbury Dam were built. That's as big as some of the biggest runs in Northern California. But the construction of Bradbury Dam in the 1950s put an end to that. EDC is working to restore steelhead flows and provide passage over Bradbury Dam so that the fish can once again reach the excellent spawning habitat up in the Los Padres. So we've been doing creek cleanups uh, for about 15 years and EDC hosted six creek cleanups last year. We removed over 10,000 pounds of trash last year alone. It was an all time record. We used to get 100 pounds of trash out of a creek and thought that was really something. Now we get over 1,000 or even over 2,000 pounds each cleanup. Last year, we averaged 28 volunteers, uh, people of all walks of life and all ages. We get a lot of plastics out of our creeks before they wash to the ocean, and we recycle everything that we can. Sometimes we even find things that are reusable. Like last year, I ended up with a hand truck and a 40 pound box of kitty litter, which made my cats really happy. Last year, we removed several hundred pounds of toxic batteries and electronic waste. We find a lot of shopping carts. We've removed as many as 12 uh, during our creek cleanups. With the increase in encampments along our creek, we've been finding a lot more trash and unfortunately human waste, which we flagged for the city and the county to come and clean up properly. And we'd love to have you come join our ranks and come out and volunteer with us for our creek cleanups. I guarantee you'll have a great time, you'll make a difference, and you'll learn a lot from our naturalists. We have so many partners and we can't say enough about them. Our biggest cleanup last year was with Channel Keeper and we had 44 volunteers. We get a lot of UCSB groups, uh, Engineers Without Borders, uh, Boy Scouts of America, school groups. And we've got a great partnership with the cities of Goleta and Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara County, which provide us with supplies. And also they pick up and dispose of all of the trash and hazardous materials that we pull out of the creeks, including paint and used motor oil. And Coastal Fund, Union Bank, Santa Barbara Foundation and Cliff Family Foundation are also great partners. We survey the creeks every year to document their health and identify problems and develop solutions. Our surveys have focused on Goleta Valley watersheds and Mission Canyon, although we are starting to look at other watersheds as well. We've surveyed as many as 18 creeks in a, in a given year. And each year we find some new problems, many of which are listed on this slide. We document exotic invasive plants like Arundo or giant reed, which is our local version of the kudzu vine from the Southeast, it's just taking over and exotic pests like bullfrogs and green sunfish, which actually eat steelhead and red-legged frogs. And people frequently pipe water from our streams, leaving them dry. We find unpermitted developments in our creeks like retaining walls, and we also find illegal dumping and water pollution. Here's a diversion along a public trail. You can see the creek is flowing nicely, but then when it gets down, a little ways, it disappears behind those boards. And that's where there's a pipe that's actually taking it 
and leaving the whole creek bed downstream, as you can see there, completely bone dry. This is why so many of the critters in our creeks are endangered. Our creeks are literally being drained uh, to become dry stream beds. And there's the creek flowing nicely. It hits the diversion box and the flows just disappear. Okay, in 2020, an intern and I were surveying Maria Ignacio Creek when we heard a flush of water. That's the tail end of the flush. Um, we got it on video. Somebody had piped wastewater from a sink and a tub into a storm drain, which flows directly into Maria Ignacio Creek in Goleta. We notified the county and their clean water staff came out and issued a violation and the owners were forced to connect the, the drain to their septic system. But who knows how long they were discharging uh, this wastewater into the creek. And as an aside, for those of you who saw James G's presentation about the Chumash language last month, Maria Ignacio was, I believe, his great, 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 great grandmother. And James, I apologize if I got that wrong, but my point being that you know, the Chumash are so important that you know, this is their land and that whole watershed is named after Maria Ignacio. Uh, unfortunately, people still clear native riparian vegetation, a sensitive habitat along our creeks. Most people understand this is not allowed, but we're still seeing wholesale removal of native trees and forests along our streams. EDC discovered this 800 foot long clear cut during a creek cleanup near Moore Mesa. The owner claimed um, they were only removing dead brush and we hear that a lot, but we documented many large willow trees just ripped up by their roots, trees over 50 years old. The owner, a tree company was actually chipping the trees when California Fish and Wildlife came out to issue the violation. Now the owners were required to implement a habitat restoration plant and plant four times the acreage that they cleared. They also blocked a public trail along the creek with barbed wire and they're being required to reopen that trail and install public access signs. We're hopeful that the recent news coverage on this issue will deter other people from clearing the vegetation along creeks. It's simply not allowed. In 2020, Edison cleared chaparral and oak woodland plants along uh, Mission Creek and dumped thousands of cubic yards of rock and debris off Tunnel Trail into Mission Creek. The creek here, as you can see, is completely blocked by the debris and boulders that they dumped into the creek. EDC reported it to five agencies, four of which issued violations and the other issued a stop work order. The DA fined Edison $3 million which may be the largest single fine ever imposed on a creek violation in the county. Some of this money is going to restore habitats and Edison is still trying to get its permit to finish the road grading work. The Mission Canyon Association and others are demanding restoration. And this is three years later and that restoration still has not occurred. Last year, Caltrans cleared one of the most natural sections of Los Caneros Creek in Goleta, removing willow and sycamore trees. Uh, EDC documented this. We checked and Caltrans said they had a permit. Uh, turns out they didn't. We reported it to California Fish and Wildlife and they issued a violation and are requiring a restoration plan. And we want the restoration to be done right. This is a sensitive creek. But the initial restoration plan was really deficient. You know, Caltrans should probably hire uh, real professionals to do restoration, um, like the people at Channel Islands Restoration, for example, just to make sure that it's done right. We receive a lot of reports from the public and we received this report in 2022 of a wall that someone built that collapsed into Devereaux Creek right near Hollister Avenue in, in Goleta. The wall knocked over the pipe and wire fence that you can see there and caused a severe restriction in the creek channel. The city of Goleta informed EDC it is issuing a violation. So hopefully this creek bank will be restored and stabilized with native vegetation, uh, perhaps another project for Channel Islands restoration. 
the, uh, at EDC's urging, the city of Goleta prepared a plan to manage and restore Goleta's creeks and watersheds. It was unanimously approved by the city council and EDC was named to the technical advisory committee along with Channel Islands Restoration, which is currently prioritizing projects for implementation. EDC and our watershed partners endorsed measure B on the Goleta ballot last year and 64% of the voters voted for measure B. It raises $10 million a year and we're working with the city to try to get them to allocate that money to restore our creeks and implement the creek and watershed management plan. EDC uh, prepares a series of technical reports on various watershed issues. We surveyed creeks from Western Goleta all the way over to La Cumbra and documented 175 different creek impairments. We developed conceptual solutions in our Goleta watershed report. We identify specific actions that can be taken, the benefits, the next steps, partnerships, and funding sources to implement these projects. We took all of the problems from that first report that relate to watershed health and fire safety in the wildland urban interface, and we packaged them into this focused report. The Kachuma Resources Conservation District received a half million dollar grant from the Coastal Conservancy to advance EDC's recommendations through a community process, ultimately to implement projects to restore our watersheds while reducing fire hazards in our foothills. And we're finalizing a similar report right now for Mission Canyon and Rattlesnake Creek. That is due out this week and we hope it will also lead to on the ground improvements in our watersheds. In 2022, EDC prepared a report that evaluates the success of the County Flood Control District's 29 restoration sites on San Jose Creek. These are restoration projects required by state permits to mitigate the damage caused by Flood Control's Creek Maintenance Program. Some revegetation sites are doing really well, but unfortunately, the permits uh, unfortunately, many have, are failing and not doing well, and the permits have long since been signed off, so they're no longer enforceable. But this fact is clear. The damage to riparian habitats caused by creek maintenance is not always being adequately mitigated. So we've identified specific actions for each restoration site and programmatic improvements to increase the success at future flood control revegetation sites. County's flood, uh, county flood control's work protects our urban infrastructure. It's important, and we work with them to identify less damaging alternatives. But when creek maintenance, such as clearing riparian vegetation, is undertaken, the required restoration must be successful or else our watersheds will continue to suffer. EDC is currently preparing a new report evaluating the success of four private restoration projects that were required by permits to offset the impacts of two housing, a hotel, and many storage developments right next to creeks in the Goleta area. Just like the flood control restoration projects, some of these private restoration projects are not fully successful and are not achieving the required results. So we've come up with recommendations to ensure that our creeks are better protected, that impacts are avoided, and when they can't be avoided, that, that restoration is successful. And lastly, before I hand it back over to Linda, um, EDC launched the Watershed Alliance last year. We meet quarterly to collaborate on the 26 groups priorities. Um, the Alliance is a diverse partnership that shares information and coordinates efforts so that the groups speak with one voice regarding issues affecting our watersheds. Channel Islands Restoration is one of our most engaged partners. That sums up EDC's watershed program. We, we organize partners to support effective policies for creek protection. We identify problems in our creeks and we facilitate solutions. We clean and we survey our creeks. When we find potential violations, we report them and follow through to make sure that the damage we discover is undone. And we educate and we involve the public in creek protection. And we will continue to fight for our creeks and for our fish and wildlife like the steelhead and the red-legged frog. 
So I will hand this back over to Linda Kropp, EDC's longtime chief counsel, to talk about EDC's very successful open space preservation program. Thank you, Brian. And um, I would just like to reiterate what Brian said that um, the creek cleanups are a great opportunity to get out in the field, you know, protect what we care about, learn something, meet new friends, um, accomplish something. So um, I think we've been posting periodically in the chat how you can uh, sign up for those. So um, thanks, Brian, for your longtime organization of that program. EDC has a long history of trying to preserve our most important open spaces. And this is one of those areas of our work where you don't really see our successes. Um, you don't see you know, the houses that weren't built or the power plants that weren't built. Um, what you see is, of course, you know, this beautiful open space, but a lot of times, you know, especially when people you know, move here many years after the long battles, they don't understand you know, how much effort it took to preserve these places. They aren't just usually um, you know, donated for preservation without some kind of a, a long story and a long battle. So um, EDC has been fortunate enough to partner with many local organizations to protect these spaces all the way from Amundsen Ranch on the south to Hearst Ranch in the north. All told, we have helped protect more than 100,000 acres that are now permanently protected. We focus on three main priorities. We try to focus on areas that provide important wildlife habitat. We also feel really strongly about supporting um, and preserving our local farmland, which is under incredible development pressures. Um, but a lot of the farmland here is organic, sustainable, provides local food sources. Um, and it's really important to preserve that so that we're not having to, you know, import um, produce that is, you know, not so sustainably farmed. And then we also have all the climate impacts of transporting such food. And then our third priority is because we are, a lot of our you know, areas on the coast is public access and recreation. And under the California Constitution, we have a right to access to the coast, but that is sometimes threatened by development and other efforts to block public access and recreation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to walk you through you know, some of our more iconic cases. This is certainly not all of them. Um, but I wanted to start with Carpentria Bluffs. Uh, this was a case we were involved with in, 19, in the 1990s. We represented the Carpentria Valley Association. And then we also worked with the uh, citizens to preserve the bluffs. This area was proposed for a very large housing project. And the Carpentria City Council actually approved the project. But being on the coast, it had to also be approved by the California Coastal Commission. So we were going to you know, oppose the approval by the Coastal Commission, but by the time that happened, a city election occurred and there was a significant change on the city council and the people that were trying to save the bluffs got elected. So they withdrew the proposal from the California Coastal Commission and denied the project. They were then sued. So we got involved in the lawsuit and eventually um, by working with the landowners, um, the city was able to um, raise the money along with partners like Citizens for the Bluffs to buy the property. So this is that main large area of carp bluffs. Um, there are some other parcels. Um, one of them has also been permanently preserved, but one is now threatened with development. So the, the effort continues to preserve the entire carpentry of bluffs. And it's important for beach access. Um, there's the seal sanctuary there, but um, onshore on the bluffs, there's a lot of important habitat and trail systems as well. Next, please. Um, Douglas Family Preserve. Uh, we represented the Small Wilderness Area Preserve um, Association and worked with other partners, including famously Dog Pack, um, one of the main proponents of preventing development at Douglas Family Preserve, which at the time was known as the Wilcox property, was because it was a very popular off-leash dog area before we had any sanctioned 
off leash areas. And so um, those dog owners put together an organization called Dog Pack, worked with SWAP and EDC and others, and opposed a large housing project. Um, eventually, uh, the city was able to work with the developer and um, Trust for Public Lands got involved to help raise some money as well. And the property was preserved. And because of Dog Pack's role, some of the property is still designated as an off-leash area. Next, please. So Elwood Mesa and uh, UCSB South Parcel, we combine these. Um, so probably a lot of you have been out to Elwood. This was a 15 year battle. Um, EDC represented Save Elwood Shores. And then as we brought in um, the neighboring property um, by Devro, we also represented the Santa Barbara chapter of the Audubon Society. But um, this battle went on for so many years because the developer proposed a massive project across that whole Elwood Bluff. And then at one point the county owned part of the property and wanted to build a big park facility with a BMX track and a velodrome and ball fields and picnic areas and just basically between the county and the private developer cover you know a few hundred acres um, with massive development. So this property includes the famous monarch butterfly groves, um, which would have definitely been impacted by the development, but also Devereux Creek, um, important raptor roosting habitat like white-tailed kites and red-tailed hawks, um, native grasslands, uh, very special vernal pools. So really an important ecosystem. And we were able to defeat the project a few times, either at the Coastal Commission or in court. Eventually the owners who were from Canada brought in a new developer and uh, he immediately met with us and some of the other groups and um, you know, asked what we, you know, was there anything that we would maybe be able to live with? And so we presented an option that we had brought forth at the beginning of the process when the county was um, reviewing the project, which was to save the entire bluff and creek um, area and site some housing up by Hollister in a much smaller development envelope. And this developer turned out uh, was on the board of the Yosemite National Park Foundation, was an avid backpacker and went back out to the site and came back and said, I totally get it. Um, this should not be developed. And so he worked with us. And by then, Goleta became a city. And the city council was you know, very much focused on saving this property. So I uh, worked with us and the city and uh, a Trust for Public Land. And then a local group, Friends of the Elwood Coast, helped raise money. And it was quite a, quite a community effort. Um, and we were able to you know, purchase the bluffs and you know, compensate the owner. And um, the project was then approved by the city and the Coastal Commission. And these areas are permanently protected. And of course, San Marcos Foothills, thank you, Channel Islands Restoration. Um, you all know about this property. Um, I'll just be really brief uh, back when the development proposal was going through the county process, um, EDC represented small wilderness area preserves and was a member of the San Marcos Foothills Coalition. Um, at the end of that process, you know, we were able to save part of the property. A couple hundred acres went to the county as part of their park, um, but we are very grateful to Channel Islands and all of the other um, organizations and individuals that helped um, ensure that the entire site is protected. First Ranch, this is probably one of Brian's and my fa favorites, um, saved 80,000 acres. Um, this was a proposal by the Hearst Corporation to build four massive resorts. Uh, so four resorts, commercial, retail, office, residential development, three golf courses, including a 27-hole golf course at San Simeon Point, Equestrian Center, Widen Highway 1 to, I believe, four lanes each way would have doubled the size of Cambria and San Simeon together. And the County of San Luis Obispo approved the project, um, but it had to go to the Coastal Commission. So it's great that we have the Coastal Act and the Coastal Commission. So we worked, we were hired at that 
point by Friends of the Ranch Land. And we put together, um, we did our own research about the potential impacts and violations of the Coastal Act. We submitted about 30 reports, including one showing that their proposed source of water was from the Arroyo de la Cruz Creek on the ranch, which had recently been designated critical habitat for steelhead. So we got the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National Marine Fisheries Service to both weigh in and let the Coastal Commission know that water could not be taken from the creek. Um, but for that and a host of other reasons, we convinced the Coastal Commission in a very dramatic hearing up at San Luis Obispo to deny the project. And then subsequently, um, the corporation worked with the state to um, sell a conservation easement over most of the ranch. Um, but in the same plan, um, Ken asked me to bring up Fiscalini Ranch, which at the time was referred to as East West Ranch. It's that open space in Cambria. If you've ever been up there between the East and West parts of town, um, beautiful coastal open space with trails and beach access and um, restored to its original name of the Fiscalini Ranch. And uh, that was part of the same plan. So we were able to protect that area as well. And then at the other end of our service area, um, Amundsen Ranch, um, crazy <laughs> development, a proposal for basically a new town. Um, this was a proposal for 3,000 homes, uh, commercial and office development, city hall, hotel, schools, and two golf courses. We represented several groups, including the Rally to Save Amundsen Ranch and several others. Um, we filed litigation when the County of Ventura approved the project, and we ultimately settled the case and um, set it up to be acquired. So it is now protected as well. And then um, Sedgwick Ranch up um, near Figaro Mountain up in San Inez area. This was a really interesting one. Um, Sedgwick Ranch is a 6,000 acre ranch that includes two complete watersheds from the ridge down to the valley, also um, unmatched assemblages of different types of oak woodlands, incredible habitat, um, was bequeathed to UC Santa Barbara by uh, Duke and Alice Sedgwick. And um, however, he died first, um, but then right before she died, she made a codicil to her will um, saying that um, part of the ranch so I'm sorry, in the bequest to UCSB, the ranch was supposed to be given to UCSB intact to be permanently protected and to be continued as a use for the UCSB um, for their science classes, but also their art classes because Duke was an artist. So it was supposed to be left the UC Santa Barbara, the whole 6,000 acres restored, you know, protected forever. But Alice Sedgwick, right before she passed away, wrote a codicil to her will saying that her half could be sold. Um, the chancellor at UC Santa Barbara at the time wanted to build an art museum. And so the deal was that UCSB could sell half the ranch and use the proceeds to build an art museum. So we were hired by some students and faculty at UCSB who learned about this and they hired us to intervene in the probate proceeding. Um, this went through probate because it was part of her will and the attorney general from the state challenged her codicil um, because it was supposed to be a gift to a state institution. So we were on their side. We lost, but then we continued to fight the lot split at the county. And eventually the land trust got involved. The county was really helpful and we were able to buy out the heirs and have the entire ranch kept together. And it is now part of the University of California's system-wide natural reserve system so that it cannot be um, you know, accessed by any individual campus, but it is preserved as part of the natural reserve system. So it's used for scientific study and research and preservation. And you can go up there if you haven't already, um, they do uh, periodic public docent led hikes. So really quickly, I know we're running kind of late. Um, I wanted to talk about our two current cases. We've talked a lot about our accomplishments and you can see how they vary <laughs> in terms of the places, but also you know, how we get to permanent protection. So we um, have been involved since 1999 in uh, trying to 
protect Naples on the Gaviota Coast. Um, this is a few hundred acres involving a couple different ranches, uh, Santa Barbara Ranch, Dos Pueblos Ranch, and uh, we represent the Surf Rider Foundation and EDC, and we work in close partnership with the Gaviota Coast Conservancy. In 2008, uh, the County of Santa Barbara approved 71 mansions on both the coast and inland sides of 101. And uh, as you can see, it's not been developed yet. Um, that's because we continue to fight. They still need Coastal Commission approval. They don't have that. Um, they also have to um, come up with an easement to protect or compensate for the um, conversion of some ag lands on the inland side. They don't have that yet. So we are still working really hard, um, trying to find a conservation buyer, but trying to protect development in the meantime. Um, one of the current issues we're working on is a few years ago, there was some massive illegal disking done on the coastal side, and we're still trying to get full restoration there. So we're working with the county on that issue. And then um, more Mesa is our longest running case that we currently have goes back to 1979. Uh, we've represented four different groups. Our current client is the Moore Mesa Preservation Coalition. Um, the site is heavily um, uh, covered with really important um, habitats, um, wetlands, grasslands, uh, raptor habitats. And uh, again, we've been successful so far. The most recent development proposal was 2012. We were able to stop that one. But again, we're trying to um, put together a purchase, um, but it's difficult with Naples and more Mesa. Um, it's really hard to work out, you know, to even contact the owners. Um, the owners of more Mesa are in Saudi Arabia and the owners of Naples are Chinese. So it's also just you know, really hard to you know, make that connection to even get um, into negotiations, but we're certainly um, gonna do everything we can to protect these two really precious open space areas. Ryan, you wanna wrap it up? Okay, I sure do. I just want to urge everybody watching to click on the chat. There's a link there for you to sign up to get plugged into EDC and come to our events, volunteer, and help us do this great work to protect these amazing open spaces and our watersheds. And we do have different events coming up. Um, our next two TGIF happy hours Best party in town, uh, September 8th and October 13th. So please do come visit us there. And then we'll just go to our last slide, which is our contact information and uh, go to questions. Okay, well, I do have uh, a few questions. Um, If uh, people would like to ask more, go ahead and type them into the Q&A section of the Zoom window. So I will read through them in the order that we receive them. Uh, Susan King writes, I'm wondering and concerned about offshore wind energy. There seems to be no discussion of the concern for whales that are affected by these structures and the noise generated in determining where to place them. And what about the safety for seabirds and pelagic species? I do not hear any entity serving as a beacon to discuss this. My concern is that it is being hushed in the financial interests of renewable energy. What is being done and what can we do as citizens who are genuinely concerned? Good questions. Yeah, thank you, Susan. I'm, I think that's a really important part of the dialogue. And it's certainly something that we've been raising throughout the process. We've been working on this issue um, since 2016. We've been you know, providing information about impacts to species to all of the various you know, state and federal agencies um, that there was a, um, so basically we, We've been collecting information about you know, where the whales are and the seabirds and the sea turtles and, and um, the most you know, vulnerable 
wildlife. And what we've learned is, you know, the further you move these projects offshore, the better. And so we were able to move the Morro Bay leases further offshore. Um, so we have some additional protection. It doesn't mean that that's complete protection. And so we're still involved with, you know, where they you know, actually get to talking about the projects themselves. Um, and so we will want to make sure that as they're looking at, you know, where to site turbines and how many turbines and how to design them and shut down protocol and things like that, we'll be very involved. And we're working with you know, Audubon and Defenders of Wildlife and you know, other groups like that. So people are really focusing on that. One of the projects um, that we're facing is actually close to shore off of Vandenberg. Um, it's the Kadimo project did not go through any of the planning that's been going on for the last seven years. This project would be very close to shore, horrible location for whales and seabirds and such. And so actually EDC and pretty much all the other groups we're working with are opposing that project. Um, it will be going to the State Lands Commission starting um, later this year. And, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate that we have to come out and oppose a renewable energy project. But at this point, um, it's just the impacts would be too great. So you have a valid point there. OK, uh, Kevin Cannon uh, wants to know which agency is actually responsible for ongoing maintenance of creeks like Maria Ignacio Creek to keep them free flowing by clearing out debris and down trees after heavy winter rains? I know the answer to that, but go ahead. Yeah, that one agency that's responsible for maintaining our creeks to prevent uh, minimized flooding is the Santa Barbara County Flood Control Agency. And they do get permits from numerous resource agencies like the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to make sure that when they do clear out the creeks, any impacts are minimized to protect species like steelhead so we can have safety from flooding and wildlife in our creeks. So if someone sees something, they could report to county flood control? Yeah, they can report to county flood control and of course always feel free to contact me um, for anything related to creeks. Mm -hmm. It's uh, great to have you folks as a resource, that's wonderful. Mark uh, Preston once uh, says, I am focused on San Jose Creek and Western tributary of Devereux Creek. And <laughs> I know uh, I recognize this when I first read it, um, something that Brian is, and EDC is of interest, of interest to them. Of particular interest is the railroad culvert at Western Devereux Creek. It has been blocked for 20 to 30 years uh, I am working. I am working it, but need help. San Jose Creek between Cathedral Oaks and Galena Beach is more about intervention than it is cleanup. Sure. Yeah, I can. I can address both of those. Um, thank you, Mark. Great questions. Devro Creek out by the Sandpiper Golf Course and the Hideaways Residential Development in Galena is blocked by a big sediment plug right underneath the railroad tracks. There's a culvert, but it's become filled up with dirt and it diverts the stream actually out of the stream bed down the railroad tracks for 860 meters and into a whole different watershed. So Devro Creek is being deprived of the runoff from a pretty significant portion of the watershed. And we've been trying to forge a, a cooperative project with the city and Union Pacific Railroad. Um, there's a lot of interest. Um, the resource agencies would like to see it unplugged. And so we've been trying to facilitate these partners to come together, undertake the necessary studies, um, and, and also use existing permits from the regulatory agencies to facilitate the process and restore flows in Devro Creek. It truly is one of the city of Goleta's uh, treasured creeks and it flows right down through the Elwood Mesa preserve that Linda spoke about. And we've all heard that many of the eucalyptus trees there are suffering from the drought. It may be that if the creek is unplugged and the flows are restored, uh, the Devro area and Elwood Mesa would, would get a little bit more water and um, would, would address that concern as well. So on San Jose Creek, 
the area Mark talked about is well known for homeless encampments, and there's definitely a need for intervention. Um, a lot of our cleanup of San Jose Creek focuses in those areas, but Mark's right. We do um, need to go back in time and time again to remove the trash from uh, near these encampments where it falls into the creek bed. So we're working with the city and the city's doing a lot. Um, the city is actually purchasing housing and providing for transitioning people who don't have homes currently into new housing, such as the Super 8 Motel over on Hollister by Fairview. So ultimately we'll be able to provide housing for people in need and clean up our creeks like San Jose Creek. Okay, interesting. Um, let's see, uh, Susan King wants to know, are you partners uh, with SOAR in Ventura County? That's a Save Open Space and Agricultural Resources Initiative. Yes, we, um, yeah, so SOAR, um, Save Open Space and Agricultural Resources, is a group that um, develop, not develop. They were not the first ones. Napa County was the first one, but then SOAR and, and Ventura County just took that model and did something that no one else had ever done. So what, what groups like SOAR do is they um, qualify measures for the ballot to provide protection of important open spaces and agricultural lands, such that if those lands are to be you know, rezoned for some other type of use, like residential development, it would have to go to a vote of the people. Um, so not saying no, but saying, you know, you need to have that extra layer of community support. What Ventura County did that no other place has done is the county had an initiative, every single city had an initiative, um, and they have a little bit, you know, different levels of, of protection, but, um, that has been a model for us. We haven't been able to do something to that scale in Santa Barbara or San Luis Obispo counties, but in Santa Barbara County, we did use that model. We have written um, ballot measures for Goleta, Buellton, and Solving, all which passed. So yeah, we, we value the work of SOAR. Great. Um, Elkin Lord, uh, wondering if any trout made it up any of the local creeks. I don't know if he you heard your uh, part of the presentation or not, Brian, and what time frame he's talking about, maybe recently. How about this winter? Yeah, it was a great year for steelhead in terms of all the rain we got. Um, unfortunately, other than down in the Santa Clara River, where they saw seven adult steelhead come up from the ocean, uh, we did not see any in our local creeks here in the Santa Barbara area but steelhead can live as rainbow trout. And we have found evidence of spawning in two creeks by the rainbow trout version of steelhead. So we're seeing small fish, it's really good news. And you know the idea is that those fish will get larger and with the next rainy cycle, go to the ocean, become steelhead and then come back and spawn. So that's how steelhead survive around here. They, um, they can live as a rainbow trout or go to the ocean and become a steelhead. It's a great, uh, great survival strategy for, for this climate. Yeah. Okay, and Barbara Walsh wants to know, what are the impacts of the wind turbines in Lompoc? So I think she's referring to the onshore wind project. Um, we were involved when that project was going through the planning and permitting process. We worked closely with the Audubon Society to um, achieve more mitigation measures. And maybe I'll let Brian address that. Um, I believe the project is almost operational. I think it's fully constructed. Um, talked to Audubon recently um, because the operator of the project did get a last minute exemption from having to get what's called an incidental take permit for Golden Eagles. Um, they still have to get the permit, but uh, they want to be able to start the project before that. And, and I think that's problematic. But Brian, do you recall what the mitigations were that we got? I sure do. Yeah, we came up with some really innovative measures that were, you know, groundbreaking. And basically, they required the turbines to be shut down during times when they were harming birds. 
And that created a lot of uncertainty because the developers didn't know how often birds would be heard. And we are talking about golden eagles, other birds of prey. Um, and it's also along the Pacific flyways. That's a very important area for birds. Um, but it did create uncertainty. And I know the developer had trouble getting financing because nobody could really say how often the turbines would have to be shut down to protect birds. Um, but ultimately, the project was, was revived and as Linda said, is being constructed with some protections. Um, and I know there are also some impacts to native plants. The California Native Plant Society was concerned about um, dis disruption up in that area near Tranquion Peak above Vandenberg and Lompoc. It's a very sensitive area. And um, you know, it's, it's hard to strike that balance. Climate change is a huge threat. We need renewable energy, um, but you know, as Linda was talking about with offshore wind, it, the turbines need to be sited in the right place to avoid and, and minimize the impacts to our amazing biodiversity in this region. Well, just in general, I mean, aren't we uh, being buried by uh, renewable energy uh, generating stations already with uh, solar in the uh, desert and wind everywhere along the coast or anywhere else and even in the desert as well. It's um, amazing the, the trade-offs we have to put up with in order to really maintain our lifestyles uh, to be able to drive the electric you know cars that we're all going to be buying uh, you know to be able to power them and uh, in order to do that in a um, in a way that at the same time weans us off fossil fuels, it, it's dramatic. Uh, so I, I understand all the concerns that I'm hearing from people about wind energy. It's just that we, of course, all have a, a massive demand uh, for energy uh, and uh, we're all gonna be beneficiaries of this fossil free uh, revolution, but it's, uh, it's not, it's not free, it's, it's cost us. That's, I guess, more of a statement than it is a uh, question for you guys, but do you have any comments? I do. Um, you know, I think what gets lost a lot in the equation are is bringing demand down. I mean, to me, that's the first thing we should do. We should first look at conservation, number one. We should then look at efficiency, number two. Uh, we can do a lot with just those two. So we need to bring the demand down first. Um, and then to the extent that we need, you know, more energy, then I think the next step is distributed renewable, you know, distributed solar. Um, so I think there needs to be a more emphasis on the hierarchy. And then, you know, I do think we're still going to need some of the commercial scale wind and solar, but it would be, you know, nice if that was, you know, the kind of the end of the line after we looked at all these other options first. Interesting. Uh, I got a couple other questions. If anybody else wants to put some in at the last mo moment here in the, into the Q&A, we'll get to them before uh, we wrap up. But uh, Carolyn Cheney wants to know, is EDC involved in fighting the Exxon subsidiaries' efforts to restart the Refugio pipeline? Big smile. We are. <laughs> we are. Um, yes. Uh, that's the short answer. I'll give you the long answer now. Um, we represent uh, Get Oil Out, Santa Barbara County Action Network, and EDC. Um, we, you know, did defeat Exxon's attempt to try to truck its oil. So this relates to the fact that the three platforms Exxon owns, Offshore Gaviota, have been shut down since 2015 because of the Plains Pipeline oil spill. So to restart the platforms, they need some way to transport their oil out of the county and they don't have a pipeline. So they tried to truck, um, but we defeated that. Um, that case is now in court and we're defending the county's denial. Um, there's been a proposal to build a new pipeline for several years. Um, we're still waiting for the draft environmental impact report on that. Um, but in the meantime now, um, Plains, which owned the pipeline when it ruptured, sold the pipeline to an Exxon Mobil subsidiary Pacific Pipeline Company, um, whether they hang on to it or whether they sell to a couple, company called Sable, 
they definitely both seem interested in restarting the existing pipeline, which is ludicrous. Um, you know, this spill didn't happen. A lot, most pipeline spills occur because there's like one rupture um, from like an external force. This pipeline leaked because the entire pipeline is corroded. Um, it's just flaking. Um, and one area, you know, corroded enough that the oil got out, but the entire pipeline system is damaged. So, yeah, they're talking about trying to restart it, and there's you know, a couple hearings coming up on that. Um, not the restart itself, but some preliminary matters. So, yeah, we are definitely very involved in that issue. And it's not just about the pipeline. I mean, that's scary enough, but it's about restarting the platforms. It's all about climate change, the oil from the platforms, the oil and gas was processed at the Las Flores Canyon processing plant um, along the Gaviota Coast. Before it was shut down, it was the county's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, it's the whole picture. Wow. Very interesting. I'm glad to hear you're on it. <laughs> uh, Barbara Walsh uh, asked, was there recently a meeting about the impacts of dismantling Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant? There was, um, so we have not been engaged. Um, we may be, <laughs> I've heard rumors that we may be approached, but um, we are not currently engaged. Um, one of our board members is representing Mothers for Peace. So I do know a bit about it, but we were, EDC was involved way back when during the original permitting. Um, so, you know, there was an agreement um, between PG&E and unions and environmental groups that was passed by the state legislature such that the that PG&E would not apply um, to renew its licenses with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So one of the reactors is supposed to supposed to close in 2024, one in 2025 because of some shenanigans at the state legislature last year um, under great pressure from the governor. That settlement was undone. PG&E has applied uh, for renewal, and um, but they don't want to, you know, go through all the hoops of having a new license. They're still, you know, they're not in compliance with state and federal environmental protection laws, and they're not, you know, in compliance with the state's um, uh, once through cooling regulations. Um, so you've got the you know, water quality impacts, you've got the safety impacts, you've got the seismic issues. Um, it's really um, pretty scary. But to answer the question, um, Representative Carbajal, because he knew there was such interest and you know, concern locally, he asked the NRC to actually come out to San Luis Obispo and hold a hearing out there and hear from the local people. Well, uh, I remember uh, attending one of the uh, Diablo Canyon protests in the late 70s. When I was a teenager, that was uh, that was a blast. <laughs> so uh, glad to see that it's uh, going away over time. Anyway, it's it's amazing that it ever got built in the first place. But uh, very good, guys. Um, that's uh, all the questions I have for you tonight. So Linda Crop and Brian Trawine, yay! Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation of the in incredible work you guys are doing. It's just really um, very heartwarming to see all of the things that you're square in the middle of. They're all things that are near and dear to my heart, um, especially even including the ones that uh, I didn't even know you were involved with. Um, thanks coming in through the Q&A for, for you folks tonight. And uh, you're all welcome. And, uh, but over to you guys again, thank you for your presentation. Really appreciate it, your great work and uh, really appreciate you joining us this evening. Thank you for the opportunity, Ken, and keep up the great work with Channel Islands Restoration. Yes, okay. thank you very much. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you to our, uh, our viewers tonight for joining us and sticking around, appreciate it. Take care, everyone, good night.